care professionals often have to be comfortable facilitating and being part of difficult conversations. Sometimes when you're faced with this situation, it helps to get another perspective. The D.H. Leonard Consulting's Grant Writer in Your Pocket service is just for that. When you need a grant professional's opinion, no contract needed, and the conversation can be as short or as long as it takes to address your questions. Learn more at dhleonardconsulting.com. But first, a little throwback. When you need assistance. Call D.H. Leonard Consulting. Then you've got a grant writer in your pocket. And grant awards can go ka -ching. Well, hello there. I'm Kimberly hayes Muga, And I'm Amanda Day. And you're listening to the Fundraising Heyday Podcast. So we're here to help you make sense of the complex world of grant writing and fundraising, including how to raise funds, win grants, and work together to change philanthropy for the better, right? That's right. And we have new episodes that drop every two weeks that typically include songs and cheesy sound effects and all that fun stuff because learning doesn't have to be boring. And we're also adding an exciting video component this year. Who could not be more thrilled than me to be coming to you from my 1950s <laughs> paneling <laughs> cave? But me, your girl here. I love it. I love working it. with the lighting she has. Come with me to the Grant Cave. This is where we are today. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by our season six sponsor, D.H. Leonard Consulting and Grant Writing Services. Their team can help make grants less stressful by assisting you with grant readiness and training, grant research, grant writing, mock review, as well as providing numerous DIY resources, guides, and templates. Don't let grants stress you out. Did you know that with every Fundraising Heyday episode, we create a coordinating blog post on their website, dhleonardconsulting.com. Check it out today. Well, listeners, I'm so excited to bring today's topic to you all. I think Kim really is too. I am. And I think we do. We, we're always going to go back to the how to do things, but becoming or coming into your own as a leader can help you do those things. And no matter where you are or whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or an ambivert or whatever, um, talking about these things and holding these things up can just benefit us all in different ways. That's true. So we've got a wonderful guest joining us today. We have Julie Bull. She is a certified Dare to Lead facilitator. So she's got those CDTLF initials after her name. Um, Julie teaches nonprofit professionals how to leave and live more courageously using the Dare to Lead framework developed by Dr. Brene Brown. Julie is a former grants professional, so that's how we know her, um, yeah. and she has a $10 million track record in awarded grants and over 20 years experience in the nonprofit sector, serving in things like marketing and public relations and grant development roles. She is a certified professional co-active coach and a McNellis com com compression, let me get that right, a McNellis compression planning facilitator. So welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. We oh. are glad. And I am probably going to be looking down and taking notes because this is a topic <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Um, but before we get started with that, again, I'd like to remind our listeners that Julie is a, yet another in our continuing series of having people on who have zero accomplishments and have done nothing with their lives just to make <laughs> us look better. So well, I especially lie, love, right? yeah, absolutely lie. But I especially love having someone who took their experience with grants and has kind of built upon that to do something still absolutely. in the same field as us, but kind of you found your niche and you've taken it to another level. And I, I can't wait to learn more about yeah. it. So. And I always, always want to have guests on that are um, smarter than me. And that may not be as hard as you think. But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, for everyone who comes on the show, they do have some kind of connection somewhere with grants or fundraising. Could be board service, could be uh, transitioning from grants and fundraising to another field. But everyone has their origin story. So, Julie, 
What is your origin story? How yeah. did you first find your way into the world of grants and fundraising? Yeah, so I, I consider myself still part of the grant community. That's really, I go to the Grant Professionals Association Conference every year, and this is my network. These are my people. I'm just kind of playing in a different playground or sandbox on the playground. There you go. Um, so I spent about 10 years exclusively doing grants, and I fell into it like a lot of people my age or older, you know, it wasn't as it wasn't something you went to school for and said, I'm going to be a grant writer when I graduate. So marketing is my background in public relations. And my first job out of college was um, at a public library. And I remember the circulation desk clerk or circulation coordinator came up to me one day and said, would you write a grant for us? And it was to increase library card holder rates with children. And we brought in a mascot. We got a mascot and we got all this fun stuff and we, we built this campaign. And it just was that first hint for me of what grants can do. When you get to play with this sort of um, additional resource that's not available in a cash job nonprofit, you can do more creative things with it. And I just kind of got hooked. We brought in the big read to that library as well. It was another grant. And then from there, I realized I really like what it takes to, you know, develop the idea and, and go after the grant to fund a new program. And I really like using it for new initiatives that really just bolster what your nonprofit is doing. So I got hooked on it and spent 10 years doing that exclusively. I got to know about the mascot. Was it a big old book with legs? Because that really... No. No, it was Leo the Library Lion, and Nothing he is wrong with still Leo. Leo. Wrong with Leo. He's Probably still doing less good. Probably to the children than a giant book with legs. That's just where my head went. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so it is more complicated than you would think to like build out everything you need to have and and keep a mascot going for an organization. But it was fun. There's a lot of stuff involved. It's very very true. We had mascots yeah. at the children's hospital where I worked, and that was yeah. Yeah. No, no walking books, though. We'll just have to maybe come up with a, a way to write a grant for that. Just to yeah. put that out there. One day. Yes. yes. Kimberly yes. and I are both big fans of the public library. So yeah, love that that's yeah. where you got your start in grants. So um, kind of a multifaceted question here, but we already mentioned that you're a Dare to Lead facilitator. Um, what I think is really cool is that you were one of the 120 professionals trained by Brene Brown at the inaugural Dare to Lead cohort back in March of 2019. Um, so first, for our listeners who don't know about this certificate um, and who don't, um, not certificate, but training and don't know who Dr. Is it Dr. Brene Brown? Yes. Yes, Dr. Brene Brown. Don't know about her. Um, could we maybe first start by telling a little bit about her and then we'll move on from there. Yes. Yes. So Dr. Brene Brown, I know you guys are super fans. I was yeah. as well when I learned about this program. She is a researcher and a faculty member. She has spent the last 20 years studying vulnerability, shame, and courage, and specifically the last seven years studying leadership. So she took her research and her body of research around vulnerability and shame and really honed in on how that shows up in a leadership setting. And she has taken her work into organizations and started a new conversation in the leadership space about vulnerability and shame. And we can't, we can't grow past the boundaries that are the, you know, limitations that our own vulnerability and discomfort and shame create for us. So she is um, very well publicized now. You, she's done, um, one of the biggest TED Talks I think that's ever been viewed. She um, has a Netflix special now. She's been a guest on countless, um, you know, shows. She's just really been out there in the last few years. Yeah. Well, and even if you're not tuned into her leadership work, I mean, she's got an incredible podcast that she yes. does. Um, I yes. A couple podcasts. Yeah. Yes. And has written several books, not just about leadership, but she's she's written a lot. That's how, that's how I first came to find her was through some of her um, 
writings. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely love her work. Dare to Lead is one of the books that she wrote, but The Gifts of Imperfection was one of the first ones and it has those guideposts that are just so rich and so um, inspirational. Yeah. Very cool. Well, what, obviously you're a fan, but what inspired you to go through this uh, cohort and uh, get this training? So I went out on my own as a consultant in 2018. So the original focus of my work was to do grants for nonprofits that couldn't necessarily bring in a full-time grant professional. Mm -hmm. And I did that for several years. And when I was in that space doing that work, I happened to, I was actually at a Grant Professionals Association conference, honestly, when this opportunity came up. And it was essentially, you know, you can become a Dare to Lead facilitator. And I honestly, sight unseen, just signed up for it. And, you know, she had a special sort of cohort for nonprofit professionals. And she was holding so many seats and it was like a discounted opportunity. And of course, as a grants professional, I could prove that I had all nonprofit clients. I kind of could check all the boxes. But um, it was just, I'm going to meet her. I mean, I'm going to meet her and I'm going to get to do her work. You know, it Uh really wasn't that well thought out because (laughs) I am 100% an introvert. So I didn't get to mention that to, to Kimberly. I know that comes up a lot in conversation, but when I got to Texas and I met her in person, I was in a room with 120 other people. That's an amazing room to be in with her. You know, I mean, I was, you know, feet away from her. It was just a surreal experience because she's really been a, a powerful figure in my life and um, an inspirational figure. But so I got to actually meet her. And when I was down there and we were learning to become facilitators, I realized you're actually supposed to be the front of the room facilitator and do this 24 hour program. And that's so far outside of the scope of anything that I've ever done in my career leading up until then. And I remember just sitting with that and giving, we do permission slips in the dare to lead program. And I wrote a permission slip out to myself that said, I give myself permission to have no idea what I'm going to do with this. I met her and I know I'm supposed to do her work some way, shape or form. And I know her work is needed in the nonprofit sector. So of that 120 that we had in the room that day, I'd say less than 20 were in the nonprofit sector. It was predominantly corporate. So I really, really think we need this work in our sector. Absolutely. So you've given us a little taste of what it was like. I'm just curious as to like the the overall experience and then how you were able to transfer or transition what is primarily work done in the corporate sector into your work and work with your clients. Yeah. So this work is universal. It, you know, it's interesting. We get a lot of women, a lot more women than men come through the program, but this work is universal to oh all. shocking sorry yes. Go ahead. i know i know oh, shocking. <laughs> it, it really is universal so it doesn't matter what background you're in or male female discipline anything but there just wasn't a concentration in the nonprofit sector in that cohort of professionals that became trained and i think it's harder to do this kind of work in a nonprofit sector where we're strapped for resources for wine but I really wanted to see more nonprofit professionals benefit from the kind of courage building work that Brene does, because you think about the conversations that we have to have in the nonprofit sector, and you think about that we steward these resources from mostly our boards are affluent, and then we're serving an underserved, under, underprivileged population, and and the ideas cannot always mesh. And so you've got that nonprofit professional in the middle of it, having to navigate it and sometimes speak up. And I I spent 20 years in the nonprofit sector and I witnessed a lot of struggle around speaking up and saying what needs to be said. You know, we want to be nice people. We want to be polite, but we're not always speaking up when we need to. And I really wanted to see more of that. I love that. That's true. And it is so true. It is, I think, particularly, particularly in the grants and fundraising, there is a benefit to being more extroverted and, and certainly able to approach people 
But for grants, it's, it is mostly about following rules set by others who hold the power because they have the money. So yeah. um, it can be a, a conditioning thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think. Well, I can just imagine things like I have. I don't do much fundraising, but the uh, company I do some work with has a lot of folks on board that deal a lot with capital campaigns and donations and different things like that. And um, we have a monthly meeting where we all come together, those of us who deal hands on and face to face with clients. And it's just an opportunity to talk about, you know, what's working, what's not, what are some issues and one of the recent things that comes across and it was one of those things I was like, man, I'm glad I was not the person who had to be at the helm of leadership, figuring, navigating that. But it was, um, they were working on a huge capital campaign project and somebody was willing to donate a nice chunk of change associated with that. But they had some strings they wanted to attach, including there was a specific person they wanted to be sit on the board of that nonprofit yes. as part of it. And so in trying to figure out like, okay, we really, we could use this money. Definitely. It's a lot, yeah. but what do we do? And ultimately yeah. they were able to, they decided it was against all of their policies. That it was, I mean, the person they wanted to sit on the board actually probably would have been a very good board member. Um, but they just decided that was, does not go with how we operate and we just yeah. have to be willing not to, get the money. And I've, they, yeah. thankfully the person was like, totally understand, still going to give you my donation. So it ended up working oh, out, no. but those are the kinds of things that like, as, as the consultant, whether you're grants or fundraising or what, th- those are hard decisions to make. And so having yeah. some guideposts, like you say, to help figure out how to navigate that, I think would be absolutely. Oh, but standing yeah. your ground and they still gave the money anyway. I mean, That's good for them, amazing. but I'm also like, damn y'all really you had to play it like that you know come on you don't you don't buy you don't buy board seats at a nonprofit. that's naive i'm, I'm sure that it happens all the time but it's like and then yeah. they gave the money anyway it's like hmm interesting <laughs> but the I mean, I mean these are some things like if you had told me when i first got into the grant field that these are some of the things you're yeah. going to have to be involved in potentially, yeah. right? I would have been like, no, I just, I sit at my desk, I write my grants and it's there. Yeah. There is no controversy like that, but yeah. there really is. And the more there I'm involved in nonprofits, the more I realize they're just as messy as local government. <laughs> like I thought local uh-huh. government politics were bad, but. Ooh. Oh no. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like nonprofit leaders often get stuck in the middle of trying to navigate all of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a great story. Yep. Yeah. That's what I'm glad that worked out. And also glad that, again, it was somebody else. I just got to sit back and listen and watch and learn from. So now I'm like, okay, if it ever happens, I've got that. I like getting experience through other people. So I'm like, I haven't had this happen to me, but I know someone who has. So let's let's draw on that. (laughs) Well, the whole courage is contagious. You know, you saw it, you witnessed it, and now you have that to draw from when you have to face something like that. Absolutely. Very true. So... Well, let's take a move um, on your website. I really liked you have five promises to your clients. And I will tell folks that are listening, if definitely go to her website, Julie Bull Consulting, and that's B-O-L-L is how you spell her last name. So JulieBullConsulting.com. She lists five promises to clients and they're not a list I've ever seen before. And it's not anything that I think people would expect, but I love it. And one of the phrases I really love, one of your promises, you say, we aren't afraid of the messy middle of problem identification, indemnification, excuse me. Tell us more about what you mean by that and what that looks like when you're in the middle of things with folks. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's interesting because I wrote that a couple of years ago and you brought that up and it really made me, it gave me a chance to go back and think about it. So I think, well, actually not, I think in the Dare to Lead program, we talk a lot about what gets in the way of courage and um, what happens when we're not able to be courageous or we're not able to um, sit with the discomfort of vulnerability and not knowing. And there's this thing called action bias where we want to rush to a solution before we actually necessarily even know that it's the right solution or even what the problem is because it makes us feel better. It gives us a course of action. And I think we saw a lot of that with the um, 
the beginning of the pandemic when we had a lot of racial un- unrest and there was a lot of people like rushing to make statements and, and say things and do things because they wanted to get in front of it. But what what were we trying to actually look at? What were we trying to solve? So that process is vulnerable. It's uncomfortable. There's a bunch of people that are in a room together that don't necessarily know the answer. It's not clean. It is messy. And I think, you know, it's true, I think, in all the work that we do, if it's grants, if it's strategic planning, there's always that stage where we bring everything together and we kind of look around and say, what what exactly are we trying to do? And it's an uncomfortable place to be. So that's what I call the messy middle. And I really think that you can build a container and hold space to really, truly get clear on what is it we're trying to solve? You know, what what do we know? What do we still need to know? You know, we just need to hold space to do that kind of work. And so that's what I was naming on the website. Nice. Mm-hmm. I like that. Well, I do like the thought of, you're right, sometimes we don't even really know what the problem is. Yes. Um, and you you just want that certainty so bad. And it's so we can rush past it. Mm-hmm. I think well, we and- can see that a lot too. Um, our, Amanda and I are seeing some of that now in some training around sustainability that we're doing. Um, for different organizations and it's identifying sometimes you're not even the right person to identify what the problem is. Yeah. Sometimes you're not including the people that you are serving or yes. sometimes the problem isn't our organization needs to go on forever. It's, are we actually addressing the problem? Or are we building plans to keep our organization going? And they're two yeah. different things and they're not, um, And it's not no disparagement. I mean, obviously you want, you you know, you don't want people to, you know, lose their jobs or do anything like that, but it's just that what really is the question around sustainability? What is it that you're really trying to sustain? And people may have very different ideas and within the same organization of what that really means. Yeah. Really great example. Well, and I was thinking, Kimberly, there's somebody we both served on the grant professionals association board together with, um, one gentleman I can think of that often would ask, but what is it we're trying to solve? And the first couple of times when we have, we're having big discussions and he asked that it, I'll be honest, it frustrated me. Cause I'm like, no, we already know the problem. We got to get to the solution. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? But the reality is, even if I think I know what the, the problem is, that doesn't mean everybody's on the same page yeah. yet. And so it's something that I've learned to like, that is a good question. We do need to have that conversation first. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, yeah, and that can I'm, also come down to the person who sometimes people who are asking those questions don't see the problem because they're a part of the problem. I mean, there's just right. all kinds all of, things. of things, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we go on to the next question, I have to preface it um, by sharing that Amanda and I are different in many ways. <laughs> oh, I gave you this question on purpose. Let's be clear. <laughs> I know, right? Clutch those pearls, because here it comes. Um, And one of the things that Amanda has chosen never to do is to use profanity or curse words. Um, And so I just thought it was so funny. We all we have an outline that we work from, and um, and share questions with our guests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And so this actually is a, a phrase that that I've also heard used by Anne Lamont and Bird by Bird. I, I, I write fiction and the, 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 the phrase in question is, um, Oh, content warning. I'm on a class <laughs> now um, is shitty first draft. And or I guess you could say, if you don't want to say, say that crappy first draft, but it's not the same. Cause I think a shitty first draft is worse than a crappy first draft. So you wrote about this, um, in the fall in a, in a blog post about you know, feelings of failure and that concept of the, of the shitty first draft and how to use that concept, whether or not you want to cuss, use that concept um, to sort of help overcome feelings of failure uh, that can actually keep people from writing at all. And I'm, I'm, I'm certainly have experienced that. Could you go into that concept a little bit more to our listeners and sort of help them understand yes. how they could use it, yeah. whether they want to say the word or not? Yeah, so there's a substitute. It's stormy first drafts if you're talking to, you know, schools or churches. 
But okay, I will say, Brene, if you've listened to her TED Talks or watched any of her yeah. work, she does use colorful language as well. Yeah, so this does. is from her. And it does resonate with a lot of people, but there are alternate words that we can use. So the shitty first draft is that very first story that we make up when we experience shame. And sometimes we're honestly not even aware that we're doing it. So this process has been huge for me. And I guess one thing that was interesting, I was, I absolutely was a Brene Brown fan before I became a facilitator. But I read about her stuff. I didn't always apply it. And this was an example of that. Yeah, SFD, the concept makes tons of sense. But I never actually wrote out an SFD until I started teaching her work. And it is a really powerful tool. And so, yeah, I wrote about in that blog post. And I'd love to just kind of unpack what the process is. Yeah. Let's do it. Perfect. So um, if you and I'll, I'll just use a story of mine. I think I used it in that blog post as well. If you were doing something hard, so you had to kind of garner up some courage and do something really difficult, and you experience shame in that moment, you're going to make up a story. And so when I first started as a consultant, I became certified in compression planning, and I decided I was going to lead a board through a compression planning session. It was my first one. And um, again, it was really, this has been a lot of new front of the room experience for me because I'm used to being more of the back of the room support and grant development, mm -hmm. um, sort of the, the conduit, but not necessarily front of the room. And I led a session. It was a beautiful session. We, we laughed. We, we had great connection. But about four hours into it, we just got stuck. And we were in the messy middle of problem identification, honestly. It just it got messy. You know, yeah. I asked a question that triggered some of the audience members and I could see the executive director getting really upset. And a board member kind of confronted me and said, what are you going to do to fix this? And I just, you know, I just, just deer in the headlights, you know, I had that panic. And I, so that was like a fall in the arena for me. And so when we go through this SFD process, we actually try to remember what exactly was happening, what happened in your body, what was the first thought that you had. And so that's part of the process. And so for me, um, the first thing that, let's see here, the first thing I want to do is I want to run away from a situation. I want to hide. So that's like my instinct. Some people want to fight. Some people want to people please. I'm always like, get out of this, you know, get out of this as quickly as you can. And I literally will almost like hold my breath and get that tunnel vision and tingly hands. So I actually write down in this process what physically was happening, what what did I experience, what were my first thoughts? And for me, immediately, it was, I have no idea what I'm doing. Who do I think I am? Why did I think I could do this? And my actions in that situation, we were four hours into a five-hour session. It was really just kind of, just cleanly, quickly wrap up. You know, we're just going to wrap up and get out of the situation as quickly as we can. So when you dig into the SFD, what we're asking people to do is to go back and think about. So when I wrote this SFD in particular, it was a year after the experience, and I still had those lingering beliefs from the conclusions I had drawn. And so you can go back and process something that's still sticking with you. So when you go back and process it, what is the story that you made up? And in that story, I like to call it like a 13-year-old version of yourself, like the most dramatic version of the story, you know, yeah. just, you know, the embarrassing version of the story. And for me, that was like the conspiracy theory. Everyone's out to get you. And it happens when you get triggered. And so for me, I made up the story. Um, let's see, it was... This board member thinks I have no idea what I'm doing, and she's deliberately trying to show everyone that I'm a fraud. That's like the craziness that happens. And so we ask people, write it down, write it out. You may not be willing to share it with anyone, and that's okay. It's probably a good SFD if you're not willing to share it because you're being really honest about mm -hmm. you know, these crazy thoughts that you're having because you're triggered and you're experiencing shame. But once you do that process of just, you know, getting honest with yourself about what physically happened, what did you experience, what were you thinking, you can look at it tangibly on paper and you can 
reflect on it and evaluate it. And she calls this the delta. I think the definition of the delta is the key learnings between what we make up about our experience and the truth found through rumbling. So you look at this SFD and you kind of challenge the thinking on it and you, you ask yourself, what do I know is absolutely true? And the thing I like about this, as opposed to going and telling someone and sharing the story, which I think is also healthy, I have to be honest with myself about what I believe. And, you know, you can't fake it. And other people might say, oh, no, you're just exaggerating. And I won't necessarily believe them. So here I have to write down what I absolutely know is true. So in this situation, um, what I know is true is I have a strong relationship with this organization. Yes, that's true. The session yielded great clarity clarity and synergy. Yep, I knew that was true. I could stand by that even though I was feeling these emotions. I know that I'm not stupid, and I do know that I was prepared. I did the work ahead of time. And this was a new experience. That's true. This was a new experience for me. And that issue that tripped us up was a complicated issue. Uh, And at the end of the day, it was an unresolved issue. Those things are all true. So you, you just kind of write down everything that you know is true about the situation and you'll eventually get to sort of, she, she, she uses a phrase that I really like where you write your own ending. You get to just sort of distill your learning into something new. And for me, my key learnings in that particular story One is the only way I will grow is to keep doing these new things and risking failure. So, you know, that's that's important to me. Participant questions and frustrations are a sign of passion around an issue. And and that's not a bad thing at all. And I did it. And I'm actually proud of the fact that I was willing to be vulnerable enough to try. And so my my experience and my recollection of that experience is so drastically different because I've gone through that process and um, processed it. And you can do this. You, I mean, we all know when we're having a ridiculous response to something, you know, we, we try to push it down. We try to ignore it. But when you feel yourself just really getting triggered, you, you know, you're having a shame response, you can go through this process and you can actually just dump, essentially get out of your system what that SFD is and then reflect on it and challenge the thinking that's in that SFD. That is so cool. Again, I had only heard it in reference to the writing process, the creative process before today in terms of just get all that out and get it on paper. And it's so much easier to revise, but you can't do anything until you create a draft kind of thing. But this is, I I really, um, I really uh, am feeling connected to this approach of Mm -hmm. just get it all out and move forward. And the idea, and I know, this comes up a lot in, in um, Dr. Brown's work, that, but the idea of almost like getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. It, you know, I'm not trying to like, I'm sure that's on some t-shirt somewhere, but the idea of being, yes, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to try new things, I'm going to be uncomfortable, but the importance of trying new things, particularly as an introvert. I think some of that, and and it's all mixed up and extroverts can have, everybody can have fear of failure. But I think sometimes a lot of introverts I know, including me, there's this baked in perfectionist tendency that makes me not want to do anything unless it's right, which is really silly because the first grant I ever tried to write was not perfect. And um, the grants I'm writing now are not perfect, but it's easy to get sort of caught in that and um, really need, you know, not being afraid to go, yeah, this is new, but I will never know unless I get out and do this thing within reason, you know, not just pushing yourself to do things that just to make you uncomfortable, just to feel crappy all the time. (laughs) Really (laughs) pick the things that speak to you and move into them and know that, that there will be failure and success and lessons and. Yeah. Yeah. And we can know all of that and still have this emotional reaction that we don't understand. So it's nice to just force yourself to go through and sort of recommit to why you, why you 
did it in the first place. May I ask, um, are you still working with that organization or do after you went through the process yourself, were you able to help them move past this or? So it was a smashing success. They're one of my success stories on my website. They're one of my sort of, nice. um, uh, what would you say, a launching pad clients that really gave me the experience I needed to refine the process that I use and, and just do more and more and more work. So nice. it was awesome. just a story, but you know, it was yeah. a story that I carried with me all the way until I went to Texas and did the um, dare to lead workshop. And, you know, I just kind of ignored it. It, it. it had a happy ending, but I still had that sort of belief, that embarrassing belief that I didn't really want to admit, but it's helpful yeah. to tell your own story when you're trying to, because people then could see their, own experiences that might be similar and then do the process. Mm -hmm. Well, two things that makes me think of, I, I liked how you talked about like you, it's not like you did that immediately after you said you did yeah. it and that I, I won't tell the whole story cause it's a long story, but the crux of it is or much earlier on in my career, I s thought I was forwarding an email and instead I've replied and it was to a funder that let's just say it was not a nice email that I should have been sending to a funder. Right. I was just kind of getting up and anyway, it ended up the whole situation finally ended up working out and the funder and I had a great relationship and it was fine, but like that's happened. That was probably gosh, at least 15 years ago or more that yeah. this happened, but every now and then something will come up. And my husband actually had lunch with this funder the other day and came home. He's like, Hey, do you remember? So-and-so I hadn't thought about it in years, but my first reaction was, Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. yes, I remember yes. her. So, yes. <laughs> I yeah. might need to go through that process myself, even though it's been that long. Yeah. Um, but uh, the second thing is, I don't, uh, Julie, I know you were at the grant conference, the GPA conference this year, but I don't know if you attended the session on vulnerability. That's exactly I what I was attend. thinking about. That's exactly what I was thinking Great about. Great session led by Melanie and um, Leilani, both, um, they're both from the Arkansas GPA chapter. Wow. And they, yeah. just talking about being vulnerable and being comfortable enough to be vulnerable. And not only did they share some of their vulnerable workspace experiences, but started opening it up. And it was such a feeling of trust in some of the stories folks were telling. And I was telling Kimberly, we've talked in le at length about that session and how much we loved it. But I think part of it is you're all... For you, I've, I've got tons of stories of embarrassing moments of me yeah. totally messing up. And for years, I held on to those because I thought if I tell anybody this, yes. my status of, oh, Amanda knows what she's doing is, yes. is going to disappear. But yeah. The reality is we all do it. And if more of us will share those stories than those who are coming up and are actually, heck, I still have them occasionally, right? I'm yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that you shared that in your blog post and are sharing that here because, yeah. Yeah. If you're not hearing me clearly, Grant and fundraising professionals, we all make blunders and yes. it, it's okay. <laughs> it happens. And well, we learn you from normalize it. vulnerability. You normalize it when you get to witness it. And when you witness someone else doing it, you can kind of talk to yourself a little differently. I, so we definitely and dare to lead. That's the whole premise is that. We want our leaders to be vulnerable. Now, we don't want them to, vulnerability is not disclosure. There's a lot of like overlap between that. This is yeah. not blatant disclosure, but we want you to be vulnerable. We want you to be open and you're much more likely to reach out for help and actually correct a situation if you're willing to be honest about it. Yep. This yeah. is just making me think, I, I know it's going to sound completely unrelated, but Amanda has been working with me long enough that she knows somehow I'll bring it home. But um, <laughs> several years ago, this was when I was still uh, functioning as an employee versus having my having my uh, consulting business. And there was a job opening at a national nonprofit whose um, mission just fascinated me. I thought this would be this breakout role. I'm, I'm going to go for this. And um, the, in the job description, I should have saved it because it was just now that I look back, I'm like, wow. Their whole thing about hiring a grant professional was that, you know, they blah, blah experience, blah, blah writing skills. And they're like, and someone who just never makes a mistake. 
Everything has to be perfect. I, I am paraphrasing, but I am not far from the truth because it's just embedded into my brain. And I remember reading that and I'm like, okay, okay, first of all, what? And it's but like, you know, never a typo. Maybe you're allowed one or two a year. And it was sort of written in this sort of, haha, we're joking, but we're not. And I was like, damn, y'all, really? And, and also, I mean, this is beside the point, but I'm like, you're not paying enough to hire somebody. No one's perfect, but that's not even enough money to get me to even think about it. And um, that, but that was the expectation going in, you know, you'll never miss a deadline. You'll never make a mistake. You're always going to be on and you're always going to fill your revenue bucket. Have a nice day. And yeah, that's so insane. I think this kind of work where you're talking about being vulnerable or getting it, it's, the idea that, that this this um, expectation of perfection is just, it's such a lie, right? It is. It is. It's such a lie. And the more we can talk about it, whether it's in leadership and, or grant writing or fundraising, and the more we can bring it to our workplaces or to our clients, the more that's just going to just gently be washed away. Because that's that was terrible. I, I have not forgotten. I, I, I did not apply. <laughs> Just to me, that was like beating, beating, right you know, no, no danger, danger. <laughs> but um, yeah, the idea, even if, and also sarcasm in a job description should also be another warning sign. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah, the idea that it, it, it had to be, per you had to be perfect. That's, we want nothing but perfection. And I'm like, y'all are probably just messy as hell in your own lives. I don't even understand. Yeah. Why yeah, do this? It is. It's it's, it's a, a lot. culture. It's a culture. Yeah, and what ends up happening is people cover up mistakes, and they become much more costly to fix. So, um, one of the things that in the workshop we talk about trust. One of the biggest trust behaviors between um, employers and their employees is my my employee is willing to ask for help. If we're not willing to ask for help, then how much damage are we doing? We're stumbling along and and trying to do something, you know, in a vacuum without having the right kind of input and feedback. Yeah. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't exist, the perfectionism. And then we create these, um, yeah, cultures, which are toxic. Absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a great way to wrap up for one of the things you offer, Julie, I know is a dare to lead open enrollment because you do cohort cohorts of training. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your next opening and how people can get involved or if they just want to find you to ask any other questions, how can people check yes. you out? Yeah. So um, I facilitate the dare to lead workshop, which is 24 hours and we go through the four skill sets of courage and we just unpack, you know, the physiology of vulnerability and how to stay in that, that physiology when it's hard, how to anchor to your values, how to get back up after a fall, which is the SFD. If you are able to implement some of these processes, then you're much more likely to go back in the arena and try again and be brave. So we go through all of that in this 24 hour program. I can do it in-house with an organization, take your whole team through it. But I also really love these open enrollment workshops because people get mixed in with other nonprofit leaders and professionals and they get to learn from one another and their experiences and everybody always can, ends up with an accountability partner. So you might have an accountability partner from another part of the country or a different type of nonprofit that you get to connect to and learn from. So I offer them at least once a year, sometimes twice a year where we do a virtual eight week program and we walk through the full 24 hours and we do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one coaching too. Yeah. So those are the two ways that I do dare to lead workshops. So you can actually find out about those workshops on the dare to lead workshop.com website. So that takes you straight to the open enrollment workshop. And then of course, juliewoolconsulting.com is everything I do. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm just deeply appreciative that um, you granted us the opportunity to talk about these kinds of things and their impact, um, not just on on uh, one's 
emotional well-being, but also in the workplace and just life yeah. in general. I think uh, I think it has a lot of great implications, and um, we're just excited that you could join us. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for, for having me. me. I appreciate it. It was great. We are so glad that you chose to listen to the Fundraising Heyday podcast, whether you've been with us for each and every episode now into our sixth season, or whether this is your first one today. We'd really appreciate it if you could follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And if Spirit moves you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be dreamy. That is what helps us connect to other people who also are hungry for this kind of connection. And if you just can't get enough of that heyday stuff, check out our website, which is super creatively entitled heydayservices.com, H-A-Y. D-A-Y. So heydayservices.com, sign up for our newsletter to know about our hot takes on the latest things happening in grants, fundraising, and life in general. Thank you again to our season six sponsor, D.H. Leonard Consulting and Grant Writing Services. We appreciate their support in making grants less stressful. Visit their website, dhleonardconsulting.com, to download their latest resources today. As Kimberly said, we are so honored you choose to spend your time with us. We're glad you were here today, but please come back again in two weeks. We are going to talk about further development of leadership skills, but we're talking about it from an introvert, extrovert standpoint. I wonder where yes, we got you are, here. and a shocking development for us, but there's something for everyone. If you're Absolutely. not an introvert, you may like one. And if you're an extrovert and don't even know what we're talking about, I am talking to you. Come on back. <laughs> See you then, guys. Bye.